I'm not, not kidding, Lauren, 20 organizations flew in and bought land and built orphanages like immediately in the first year after the tsunami. I remember thinking, this is crazy. Like, what are we doing? Welcome to the show where we talk about topics in modern Christianity that are so challenging, they require us to be grounded in something much bigger than ourselves. If you're here, you have likely found yourself hungry for something deeper. You want to find answers for how to hold on to your faith after seeing religion be twisted in a way that has somehow become bad news instead of good. I'm here for all of that too. I'm here for the spiritual wrestle, and I'm here to learn more ways that people are finding hope in a God that interrupts our norms and expectations. I can't thank my team at Kindred Exchange enough for being willing to bring podcasts like this to the world of global missions. We are committed to fostering conversations and facilitating cross-cultural exchanges that empower the global church to serve together. At Kindred Exchange, we believe that missions is and should be considered mutual, where the church in North America is carrying out the mission of God with the same invitation as the church in Zimbabwe, Peru, Myanmar, and Iraq. We are all offering a unique flavor of hospitality to the world, and we are made whole by one another's walk with our Creator. Within our organization, you'll find followers of Christ who love missions enough to see it done differently, and we welcome you into our exploration of the reformation and redemption of the North American mission system. Check us out at kindredexchange.org. You guys are in for a treat today because I have one of my favorite people in the entire world on the podcast. Kimberly Quinley is joining us from Thailand and we got to know each other because I chased her daughter down at a conference in Hong Kong because I could tell she was the coolest person in the room. And um, (laughs) we ended up living in Kimberly's house when I was pregnant with my third baby um, and we were waiting on him to be born in Bangkok. And so I had reached out to Carter, uh, Kim's daughter and said, do you know anyone, you know, where could we go for a couple of months while we're having this baby and working on our immigration paperwork? And uh, she's like, oh, I'm here to be, would love to have you. And I don't even think she asked permission. Um, so I should probably lead with all of your credentials, Kimberly, but your person is, is just really what takes center stage for me and who you are and how you share your home, how you live out your values with everyone in your community. You've lived in Thailand for decades now and have just practiced hospitality in every way possible. So we'll tell some of those funny stories, but welcome. And thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time today. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. And you're definitely one of my favorite humans on the planet. And no, I did not, was not asked permission if you could stay at my house. It was basically, oh, mom, I told this girl, Lauren, I met in Hong Kong that she and her family can come stay with you for a few months. (laughs) I'm like, okay, (laughs) sure, (laughs) we have room. (laughs) <laughs> Not to mention that we were still norming as a family. Um, so we had, we were still within our first year of our adoption yes. um, and mm. had lived in three different countries that year. Thailand made the fourth country in 12 months that we had lived in. I was humongous and pregnant in the April month of Southeast Asia, which if you oh. know how the weather patterns are, that is the hottest time of the year. And um, so you know, we were with you guys for several weeks. I lost track of how many things my kids broke or lost in your beautiful home. And we were trying to homeschool and, and share a kitchen. And what I loved most about being there was our conversations at night, just sitting around the table and getting mm-hmm. to know each other. such a blessing to us. And thankfully, um, when Quinn was ready to come, your husband was, John was up for the task of driving me to the hospital. I was very nervous. I remember thinking, why haven't they left yet? Why haven't they left yet? Like, I knew you were like just about to give birth. And I was so nervous. And um, you were so relaxed. And I, and I think it was like a wild Friday night or so. I don't remember what night it was, but it was raining. It was like a Justin Bieber concert. I mean, it was so weird. Yeah, it was. It was the first time Coldplay. Coldplay. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Yes. And so the traffic was horrendous. And I thought that baby's going to be born in our car, which it almost was, you know, I mean, thank God, thank God your husband is a doctor. (laughs) Well, he did not feel prepared to deliver that child. And I, we did not have the financial stability to pay for the leather seats in your car. (laughs) And so I was like, I was, I was really praying that we could get there. I, I looked up in the front seat and after a long time of being in the car, just trying, I mean, fighting gridlock traffic, uh, your husband, John's knuckles were so white and I could tell that he was counting between my contractions and I had tried to keep it cool and not make the men uncomfortable in the car. But by the end, I was like, I was about to crawl out of my skin and uh, John was counting and then he turned around. He was like, I think they're like one minute apart now. And I was like, yes, they are. Yes, they are. I'm really trying <laughs> to keep it cool. <laughs> but by the time we um, could park and get back into the, you know, park in the parking garage and get inside the hospital to check on us, Quinn was here. I mean, it was like the fastest thing. Yes. Like, we had already chosen to name him Quinn, but the fact that you guys are the Quinleys was perfect. Um, man, I just want to bring everybody who listens to this podcast into my life and into the story because you guys are just such a huge part of that. Oh, it was so much fun. But I will say I was pretty stressed that night. And you seemed very relaxed to me. But anyway, well, it was great. I am so glad that that came, that that was the impression that you got. Because on the inside, I was about to tell every man where they could go and what they could do. And I <laughs> actually did. <laughs> but, um, uh, were- well, that began, that had begun a really good good friendship between us and of course you and Carter K our daughter are such like sisters but um I get to reap the benefits of that when she shares how loved she feels from you and your family and yeah we're just grateful that you guys are in our life well I feel the same way and love having Carter on the side of the ocean now she is making such incredible impact through her work um we intersect if if people follow me online they've probably seen her in several of my posts because we our worlds collide in the human trafficking anti-trafficking space a lot um but I'll say Kim one of the things that stuck out to me so much about our time in Thailand was getting to sit over tea or coffee with you and and talk about your work and what had kind of transpired over your time I think Mm. we are always looking for mentors and people who have gone ahead of us and to have lived life in ways that we have yet to experience. And what you had done was raise children abroad while Mm -hmm. engaging with the issue of orphans and vulnerable children. And you had learned so much and you're the type of person that has the tenacity to try to um, correct systems. As an Enneagram one, I know that comes naturally, (laughs) but um, I would love Uh, for you to just kind of start out today, kind of introducing everyone to your story, you know, what, what led you to Thailand and what did those first few years look like? Um, Take us Mm -hmm. us back to that time. Okay. Well, um, I went to Thailand in 1984. Can you believe it? It's going to be 40 years next year. That's a long time. I was 10, of course. And um, (laughs) I was 10 years old when I went to work in Thailand. Um, Anyway, uh, I went in 1984. I was a school teacher and had my summers off. And there was this lovely missionary who came to our church and shared about her orphanage. And I just really felt called. And so I went for a summer, fell in love with the kids, of course, didn't speak the language and really understand all the nuance there and the complexity of orphanage care, but um, loved it. And so couldn't wait to go back, went back to the States, spent a year um, teaching school, and then went back for two years and lived at that orphanage. And as I began to understand the Thai language and see summers come and go when kids would go home, and I'm thinking, hmm, this is interesting. Why are all these children going home when we're protecting them from unsafe environments? Um, So I learned a lot during those few years that I was there as a single missionary. I ended up um, falling in love with John. He was a sponsor at one of the orphan at the orphanage. And um, he, 
I guess I met him when he gave me a doll that said, Hey, can you bring this? I sponsor this girl at this orphanage. Can you bring this doll to her? And I'm like, this is a great guy. Like he sponsors orphans. Yeah. He's a keeper. But anyway, <laughs> long story short, we got married. We had four children of our own. And I think even having my own children made me realize the importance of family and mothering and, um, that what those children really needed was their family and their mothers or grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I learned a lot in that, those first few years. You know, the, I, I talk a lot of, about bringing humanity into these issues, but when you read about orphans or you read about the orphan crisis in a sterile environment, mm -hmm. it's really mm -hmm. easy to create your own narratives about these children. Mm -hmm and about mm -hmm. how they function in the world. And we remove ourselves and our own life experiences that really would connect us to who they are mm -hmm. and what they need. And so I love that you're, you know, immediately building that bridge um, between your own life, your own children and the kids that you're working with and saying, we are not different. We are really, mm -hmm. we are really the same. Um, as you think about where you were when you first moved abroad and you've, you've nodded mm. to this a little bit, and this won't be new to anyone who has lived cross-culturally, but what would, what would the Kimberly of today tell that Kimberly that was in her first few years of, mm. of Thailand and working in this field? Well, obviously the first thing I would say is leave your white savior cape at home. Um, I definitely mm -hmm. had preconceived ideas about culture and religion and orphan care and um, leave all of those things at home, of course, and become a learner. Listen, listen, listen. Um, there's a scripture that I talk a lot about because it's one of my favorite scriptures that says, um, desire without knowledge is not good. And one who moves too hurriedly misses the way. And I think about me as that young, early 20s, you know, I only taught school for a few years. And then I find myself in Northern Thailand on the Burmese border, caring for a hundred orphans and realized that I had so much passion and so much desire to really care for the orphan because that's what the Bible says, right? Um, but I had no knowledge. I mean, yes, I was a school teacher, but I was not a social worker. I didn't understand attachment. I didn't understand the push and pull factors of safe and unsafe migration and why children moved to the cities for school. And I didn't understand anything. And really, it took me years to fully grasp that. So I think slow down, move slowly, listen. Um, that's what I would have told my earlier self. You know, that really bumps up against something that I shared with Dr. Kristen Cheney coming from outside of the faith community. Mm -hmm. I think she found this very shocking to say, you know, we have this saying of God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Oh gosh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I have heard that a time or two, <laughs> but that, uh, rubs, yeah. I mean, that, that is the antithesis of the scripture that mm -hmm. you just referenced. Mm -hmm. And how have you seen that? How have you seen that play out? Maybe as the American church um, engages in Thailand, <clears throat> how, how have you seen that play out um, in, in your life or in the lives of those that you, that you kind of rub up against in, in Thailand? Well, it's interesting thinking about the, um, did you say the Thai church? How is the Thai church? Or are you saying the American well, church? Well, how is the, you know, if, if that is the mantra coming from the American church within the ethos, mm. religions, right, that, that right. you know, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And, mm -hmm. and I, you know, a lot of feelings around that statement, but just bringing that back to the surface again, how, how have you seen that kind of show up or impact the communities where you work? Well, in Thailand, for sure, <clears throat> the first time, well, for many years, I grappled, of course, with all of these issues and wondering what the heck am I doing and why am I here and um, why are these children here? And it was a really hard few years to try to figure that out. I remember after the 2004 tsunami, we went down, our organization is called Step Ahead and we went down to build child development centers for all of the families that had lost their homes and their businesses. And 
I'm not, not kidding, Lauren, 20 organizations flew in and bought land and built orphanages like immediately in the first year after the tsunami. I remember thinking, this is crazy. Like, mm -hmm. what are we doing? And, and so I'll share a quick story and then kind of get to where the church falls in that. But one day I pulled my car up to a child development center and, and I saw this orphanage director on the porch signing over one of our kids that attended our um, center and her mom crying, signing this contract of 18 years and every three months the mom could visit. And, and I remember saying an 18 year contract, 18 year old. Con yes. An 18 year contract. Wow. And so um, I remember thinking, what is going on here? And I asked the mom, I'm like, what are you doing? Are you sure, you know, that you want to give your child away? And she just like, looks at me and says, Kun Kim, Miss Kim, Auntie Kim, I don't know what I'm going to eat tonight. And so this woman is telling me that she will provide food three meals a day, education. My child could even go to university. And so I I don't know what I'm going to eat. I'm living in a displaced person's camp with a family I don't even know. And I don't have a job and I have no food. My husband died in the tsunami. What am I to do? And I remember thinking of Moses, you know, fighting the biggest battle of his life. I think a lot of your um, listeners are Christian, but I thought of that picture of Moses where Aaron and Ur was holding his hands up. And I thought, this is what this woman needs. I mean, she needs this poor mama. I mean, she was 20, 22 years old. She needed someone to hold her hands up and allow her to keep her child. So we said, if we, if we make sure you have food tonight and you have food until you find a job, will you keep your child? And she said, yes. And so we started a program called Keeping Families Together that we had no idea we were starting or what we were doing. We were completely clueless, but we knew it was the right thing to do. And so um, we ended up spending about six months just looking at what does the Bible actually say about caring for orphans and vulnerable children? What does the social science say about it? What is the legal framework for looking after children? When we realized that orphanages was probably not the best thing to do, um, we started doing um, inviting the church in to these conversations. And I remember the first time we had about 20 church pastors come. This was Southern Thailand in the same place where the tsunami was. And we shared some of these scriptures with them. There's like seven themes woven throughout the Old and New Testament. And we asked them, what do you think about this? Like, what is the church's role? And I remember one pastor said, well, I know for one thing, it's the missionary's role to open up orphanages. So that's what we as a church do when there's a vulnerable person in our community, a vulnerable child, we just send them to the orphanage because that's the missionary's job. And I remember going, oh my gosh, that was me, right? I mean, I recruited orphans. I did all of those things. So that was the church. And that's still to this day in Thailand, the church really believes that the orphanages are um good work. And there's actually courses in seminary where you can learn how to run an orphanage to get support for your church. We also see a, a growing movement of change mm -hmm. um, around the world. I mean, not just in Thailand, but around the world, there's a, there's a group of people, well, many different organizations around the world that are moving in this direction of family-based care and understanding that children thrive best in family in safe and nurturing families i'm not saying keep a child in a family that's unsafe but how can we find a family that is safe for that child instead of orphanages so so yeah the church loves there's do you know lauren it's 40 million dollars a year that is invested in Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai. That's only two provinces in Thailand. There's 70 provinces, 77 provinces. Two of them have $40 million from the American church coming in every year, pouring into hundreds of mm -hmm. orphanages. So like if you think of, of Philadelphia, 1.6 million, Chiang Mai has 1.6 million, and we counted over, I think it's now the number is probably 250 orphanages and probably another 250 dormitories being run by really well-meaning, good-intentioned Christians. I mean, if we were looking at 250 orphanages and 250 dormitory-style <laughs> houses in Philadelphia, what would the media be saying about that city? What would, you know, what would, what would our government be saying as an approach like, oh, we have a massive crisis. Where have all the parents gone? <laughs> uh, right. Right. 
And I want to go back to that. I mean, just such a heartbreaking story that that you told about the mom standing on the porch, signing over her child, really mm-hmm. feeling like she didn't have any other options because oh. the option that was being placed in her lap was too good to say no to. Mm-hmm. She mm-hmm. felt that in order to be a good mother, the best thing she could do for her child was to hand that child over. But that offer was placed in her lap by someone who was assuming that they could care better for that child by removing that child from their mother. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. With really good intentions, to be honest. I know of this course. Woman personally. And um, and that was me, right? If you go back to 1984, that was me. I was the white woman who came with my preconceived ideas and knowledge and what I thought skills and I was going to save all these kids Mm -hmm. so um, I was not looking at all of the complexity and the nuance and all of the issues the you know I wasn't looking up the river right to say Mm -hmm. why are we plucking these kids out from the river is you know we weren't looking up the river poverty breakdown of the family incarceration all the issues that that make families natural disasters that make families become open to separation to, you know, leaving their child. Mm -hmm. So I I mean, I don't want to judge her, although I might not have used really nice language when I told her to get off my property, but um, I definitely don't want to judge her because I was her. Right. And, and like, you know, I I think it was Margaret Mead. No, who was it that said um, when we know Maya Angelou, when we know better, we do better. Right. And so I had learned and I had read, I mean, I read Craig Greenfield's book, you know, the urban halo, a case study in, in Cambodia, where he looked at orphan care in the slums Mm -hmm. and how can we do that? Well, with grannies and aunties and single mamas, Mm -hmm. I had began to learn and study and, and understand that there's a better way, but my, you know, 24 year olds, good intentioned hearts, thought what I was doing back then was a good way. And so many things that we do in our early twenties are because we are, we feel stuck. And I'm going to, I'll speak to this from, you know, within the Christian framework, but I think we see our privilege. We see our access to resources and we see, you know, a mandate that uh, certain verses from scripture that have been plucked out and held as the highest, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. level. And I don't know how you can really Uh, debate with pure and undefiled religion is, you know, so, you know, within the context of, of James one, six, you know, we, we or 27, sorry, James one, 27. I mean, that is, that is a beautiful mandate. I would, I would um, actually debate that it's an invitation rather than a mandate, but we feel so often, especially in a Western driven interpretation of scripture that we are sinners and that we have to be saved that that framework of the gospel where Mm -hmm. we will never be able to earn our salvation but we better spend our life trying (laughs) right right Um, well i mean the thing is what we do is we just take that verse out of context mm -hmm. right because we're not looking at all the scriptures from the old testament to the new testament and what do they actually say about caring for the orphan the vulnerable children i mean in hebrew yatom for orphan means lonely, mm. abandoned, deserted, right? So it's a much broader picture of who the orphan is. And in that scripture you just quoted, religion means worship. Mm. So our acts of service towards the lonely, the fatherless, the abandoned is our worship, right? That's how we worship God through those acts of service. But I think it blew us away when we spent those six months just reading the Bible and looking at these seven, we just saw these seven themes of what the church is called to do for these orphans and vulnerable children. And instead of just handpicking those few scriptures, I mean, let me tell you the orphanages I've been to where it says that scripture on the wall. And that's the first thing you see when you walk in, right? It doesn't show you that all the scriptures also mention the widow, which again, if you look at the original text, the widow is divorce, death, or abandonment. So it's that single mom next door, right? And so we have to think of this bigger picture. Just because she's a single mom doesn't mean she is not capable 
of caring for her child. And what are we doing about that single mom next door? Whether it's in Philadelphia or whether it's in Bangkok, you know, who is she and how can we meet her needs? So that how can we be that Aaron and Er in the Moses story, right? To hold up her arms and to make sure she has the resources that she needs to keep her children, because that's what the Bible says, right? Mm -hmm. That is the church and families that God has called. He created the family. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Think Orphan. Think Orphan is the podcast for orphan excellence. Since 2016, Think Orphan has been facilitating conversations in global child welfare, orphan care, and Christian thought. Hosted by Brandon Stiver and Phil Dark, every other Tuesday they discuss issues of foster care and adoption, child protection, and cross-cultural ministry with leaders from around the world. Subscribe to Think Orphan on Apple, Spotify, or whichever podcast platform you prefer. Absolutely. And and there is also an industrialization of this, mm. right? I mean, yes. you mentioned how many millions of dollars are pouring into two provinces in one country. Mm -hmm. In Haiti, it's 70 million a year. And that's a low number. I mean, Lumos did that research and that's a low number, $70 million. I mean, I, I know of an orphanage director in Chiang Mai who just spent $3 million. I'm like, Okay, $3 million to buy land and build a building for children at risk of human trafficking. I'm sorry. You know what we could do with that $3 million? We could go into those communities where those children live that are at risk of human trafficking, and we can help the community understand what are the things to look for when you're being groomed. What is human trafficking? I mean, so much community development could happen with $3 million that they got to buy land and build a building. Yeah, so I think our church resources in the West have got to be um, redirected. Absolutely. To family strength care. I mean, family strength. Family strength being covered. Money had been used to develop a business that would include a child care center within the business where the parents could bring their kids, yeah. and then they could yes. um and then and then take care. I've I've shared this story before, but I remember one day um, my kids went to an international school next door to Thailand. And one of my kids came home with some new shoes one day. And I was like, oh, where'd you get those? Where'd you get those shoes? She said, oh, there were some missionaries that came to the school and were giving new shoes to all the poor kids. <laughs> and that is how she told the story. And I was like, okay, immediately in my heart, I was like, oh, they think I'm poor and that I can't provide for my own child. Mm -hmm. How many times have I put other families in that exact same position mm -hmm. of robbing them of their dignity, robbing them of their ability mm -hmm. to care for their children because I thought I could do it better. Or mm -hmm. I thought I had something that their children needed, that they were, you know, mm -hmm. not providing. I mean, whether that's through shoe boxes at Christmas or angel trees at Christmas or things that I've brought over in suitcases and given out on short-term mission trips and oh, yeah. the local economy. I mean, so many ways that that I have not considered my role cross-culturally mm -hmm. through kinship, through mm -hmm. altruism. And I am, <clears throat> or, you know, pick a word, saviorism. Thanks. I remember sitting at your table and you said that there were pastors who were starting to see the gaps, starting to notice that maybe institutionalized care for children was not what they needed developmentally, not what they needed emotionally, not what they needed spiritually. And yet they were trapped because mm -hmm. their income and the way that they were able to provide for their own families was because of Western. Mm -hmm. um, can we dive into that a little bit and, and share sure. what, what you see in that realm? Yeah. Well, um, you know, when we started doing training to churches, about these seven themes, about what does the Bible really say, the biblical framework for caring for orphans and vulnerable children. I mean, you just start seeing these light bulbs go off, right? And they're starting to connect the dots. There were people in our audience that, you know, I could see were emotionally upset by this message because they had given their own children to the orphanage to be raised because they'd get devotions every day. And, you know, as a pastor, you don't have time to be with your kids. So you send them to the Christian orphanage where the missionary is, they'll learn English and they'll get a good education, probably go to college and get the Bible every day. So it's a win-win. 
Um, but as they begin to see, you know, we start teaching them even about attachment and they start learning about trauma. I mean, the first day of our training is trauma-informed care. And so when they start to recognize, oh my goodness, this separation, that initial separation of the child being uprooted that day, the trauma begins. And then of course continues with overcrowded homes and abuse, not only from the directors or the people who are supposed to care for them, but the older boys or the older girls in their home. I mean, there's so much that we won't go into today, but um, but anyway, so when we begin to share those important parts of a child's development and what trauma is it's it's three sessions you know how we love how we hurt how we heal and so looking at that the church can start thinking oh wow and then looking at the biblical framework this is how we're supposed to care for orphans and vulnerable children i mean we do fun activities community mapping where we put the church in the middle and they map out who are the vulnerable people in their community and instead of sending those kids to the orphanage what are other things they could do how could they as a church you know train others to care for orphans start doing it themselves so it's been a very slow process i mean it's been nearly 20 years that we've been running this keeping families together program and we've trained hundreds of churches and to be honest there's just a handful that are really out there doing the work. It's growing. I, I shouldn't be discouraged. I mean, it's growing for sure, but it's a it's a very big mind shift, right? When you have forty million dollars coming in, and and it's coming in free, and you can use that to care for orphans, but it's not coming to care for the single mom down the street that from your or from your church. Then how are you going to get the money to care for her? Mm -hmm. right who's gonna in the church rise up so it, it's it's very complicated there's mm -hmm. no super easy solution but we have seen the church change here and um we've seen the government change here we've there there's a lot of change going on i mean thailand's at a crisis and i told you that before you know we often think of haiti as like the worst country on the planet in terms of orphanages per capita but thailand's right up there with Haiti and people don't know I mean, there's 120,000 children in residential care tonight you know and that's in 700 orphanages across Thailand 68% of those are run by Christians so mm -hmm. I mean it's a it's a crisis it's a really red zone and we're trying to wave our flag as much as we can but um it's the church in America that actually has to change you know the church started caring for, or I mean, first century church, right? What did they do? They cared for orphans and vulnerable children. That's what, that was the church's calling. It wasn't, I think, until the fourth century when they started institutionalizing it. And it was years that we did that until um, really it was John Bowlby. I, I don't want to give him too, oh, he gets a lot of credit. I mean, in the fifties when he came up with attachment theory, right? And we in America started realizing that, oh, there's this thing called attachment. Maybe our institutional care is not best for children. And so, of course, we started the foster care programs. We know that's not perfect. But let me tell you, there is a growing group of Christians in America who are called by God to do foster care and adoption. And they're amazing. You know, there's a group called CAFO, Christian Alliance for Orphans, and they really are pushing um, the American government, pushing churches, pushing state legislation. I mean, they're doing phenomenal things to get foster care, to have a better reputation. Um, you know, because foster care has a bad reputation because the only bad things we hear is on the news. We don't hear all these amazing families that I know personally who are doing phenomenal jobs with adoption and foster care. We mm -hmm. don't hear about them. Um, there's another growing global movement called World Without Orphans. And it's where the church, I think there are 90 nations around the world that are saying, let's rise up and have a world without orphans. We don't have to have this anymore. Um, so there are these, these growing movements around the world. Um, the secular group was before us, long before the church. You know, they were very aware of all of this before the church, but, but the church is on its way. I mean, it's, it's slowly moving forward. You're very generous. I hope. Uh, yeah, I, I do too. And I, you know, I think it's conversations like this that that I hope and why we wanted to have the season is because I hope that the church that is really driving so much of the funding because mm. of compassionate hearts and people who want to do well 
to really allow them to see the impact that their dollars are having in in ways that are driving this movement more than anything else. Um, Brian mm -hmm. McLaren talks about 13 different biases that people have. And he, he yeah. has a book and he's got a podcast all about it. I think it's fantastic. One of the things that he mentions is cash bias. And when money yeah. is injected into a scenario, it totally shifts the way that people respond to even their value system because, yeah. you know, you know <clears throat> cash speaks. And so when you're looking, I mean, <laughs> you painted a perfect picture. How do you reject $40 million that someone is telling you how they want it spent and it's also mm -hmm. going to provide a stable income for you. How do you, how do you reject that? It's really hard to separate yourself and your small circle and say, well, if I do it, it'll be fine. And we have to see this larger movement that's going on to see how our individual actions are being mm -hmm. repetitive in countries where people are, are choosing to work to the point that we are almost handicapping those communities um, by our approach. And when we're not listening, like you said, um, it makes it really difficult. I Well, I um, think about, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, you know, think about the orphan trains in America. Think about the residential schools in America and Canada and Australia, right? And what England did sending 150,000 kids to Australia for orphanages and to work. So we did all of that. And that was in recent history. Okay. Yeah, will you tell everyone where they can find out more about those? Because I think that that might be part of our hidden history that we don't discuss much. We're, I think you have a couple of pod, um, a couple of documentaries that you recommend. I do. I do. And, and I will definitely, you can put it on the show notes or something, but Rabbit Proof Fence is a great uh, book, movie that shows what we did, uh, what Australia did to Aboriginals, orphan trains. There's lots of books about orphan trains in America where we put impoverished kids, not necessarily Native Americans, impoverished kids in the East Coast and move them to the Midwest to help farming and help families who didn't have kids. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course we have all of the Native American residential schools that were to change their religion, their language, their culture. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, what's so sad about that is that we have taken that exact model and now duplicated it in Thailand. Right. So what we knew is wrong and what there has not been an actual public apology for that in America yet. I mean, there's been some apologies in Canada. Australia made a huge apology for what they did anyway. We are doing the exact same thing. I think when I had that revelation, Lauren, it hit me like, oh my gosh, we're doing what we know is wrong. We are going to these tribal villages in Northern Thailand. We're removing kids. We're basically stealing kids from those villages and putting in them in these safe homes. They lose their language. They lose their culture. They lose their religion. We're doing the exact same thing. And without a license to operate, do you know 50% of homes in Thailand don't even have a license to operate. So if you can imagine in America go, opening up an orphanage for poor kids in the inner city and you don't have a license to operate, you don't have a psychologist on staff, you don't have a social worker, you just have a good heart. So you're going to open up a home for them. Well, anyway, that's what we did with the indigenous people of America, right? Canada, Australia. It's very well documented. But we have basically taken that model and exported it in our missions. And that's got to stop. I mean, that $40 million, $70 million in Haiti. I mean, those are two countries. Can you imagine Uganda, Ethiopia? I mean, like all the other countries in the world where the church's dollars are going to this work that is not God's heart at mm -hmm. all. You know, as you, as you paint this picture so vividly, and we will have, we will have a couple more episodes that are specifically focused on human trafficking within the orphan care and adoption oh. industry. Okay. So we'll, we'll dive a lot deeper into this, but the way that you've laid this out so clearly is, is showing me without a doubt that we are, we are also acting as traffickers in these kids' lives. Oh, um, yeah. We are plucking them out of their homes. We are we are removing them. We are coercing parents, mm -hmm. families, and we are using scripture 
as a mm-hmm. means of trafficking kids, much like yeah. we use scripture to justify slavery years ago. I mean, I, nice. I, it's, it's shocking how we can really misinterpret what um, the Lord's heart for kids and for families is um, mm-hmm. when we want to industrialize an invitation to be obedient to his call. You mentioned a formal apology, you know, and how Canada and Australia have have made such apologies, especially to their Aboriginal mm-hmm. people or Indigenous people. What would mm-hmm. church uh, apology, what would a formal apology from the American church look like in terms of owning our past ill-informed practices around orphan care? Well, I want to take back what I said earlier. I mean, the church has made some apologies for sure, like... Um, I think it was 1995 when the Southern Baptists officially renounced the church's support of slavery and segregation. 1995, 1995, right? Um, The Methodist church had a ceremony of repentance in 2012 for injustices against Native Americans. In 2016, it acknowledged its role in the boarding schools. Okay. um, And that there had intentionally tried to destroy traditional culture and belief systems. So that's big. That was 2016. After a massive social media campaign. Right. Right. Well, also, and more recently, we know because of Canada and what came out with the boarding schools in Canada, all the children's graves that were found that, you know, died under the care of these caregivers, the church caregivers that were never mentioned and then just found. Catholic Church has made some apologies, right? They apologize. I forget who it was that said that the biggest abuse was not what happened in the schools, but the schools themselves, Mm -hmm. right? That was a big problem. There have been some apologies, but I think they're just in these little pockets. So they're not like the whole country of America isn't aware of these things that are happening. We need more people to understand trauma. I think when people start to understand the trauma of separation Mm -hmm. when a child is separated from their family and they begin to understand attachment, it's then when they can begin to put those pieces together. And so the church has no idea the trauma that they've caused. I mean, I've interviewed kids here in Thailand, Lauren, who say this same thing. They were robbed of their language, their culture. I mean, one little girl, she lived at the orphanage where I worked. And so I interviewed her, you know, 30 years later. And she said the hardest thing for her was that she lost her language and her culture and her identity because she lived in the city, the orphanage in the city, and they learned Thai language and not her her tribal language. And so the first summer when all the kids were going home, she wasn't allowed to go home because she didn't have Thai language enough. And so she lost her native tongue. So when she eventually was able to go home for a summer break, she couldn't speak to her mother. That was at the Good Christian Orphanage where I worked. So you can imagine I have a lot of um, things I've had to reconcile with the ways that I myself did things. Again, you don't, you know, you do better when you know better. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm learning and I am a learner and I will continue to learn and grow and do better. But it's heavy when we think about what we've done in this generation. It's heavy. And I think some people will hear this and say, but what would have happened? You know, like, what do we do? We we did a study of care leavers or what we like to call them now as children who grew up in care. Mm -hmm. Um, And many of them have said to me in this research, why didn't you start a family strengthening program when I was growing up? Why didn't someone care for my mother? What if you had invested the money? Some are so articulate and have college degrees. What if you had invested the money that you spent on caring for me in the orphanage and put that in my mom? You know, Craig Greenfield says, you know, when will we learn to stop spending the money on taking kids away from their communities instead invested in their communities, right? Oh my gosh, I read this great book called The Boy at the Gate. Mm -hmm. And this is an Irish boy who grew up an Irish boy. He's a little bit older than me now, but um, he grew up in an Irish orphanage. And he says that same thing in the book. It was fun. We did a book club and um, he was able to join the book club, but he talked about what if the money, he uses the same words. What if the money that was invested to the Catholic sisters had been given to my mom? I could have stayed with her. I was not an orphan. 
right? I had a relative. So that's another myth that we have to start debunking is that there are many kinds of orphans, right? There's a double orphan where both parents die. There's a single orphan where one dies. There's an economic orphan poverty, which is 80% of the children in the world are in residential care because of poverty. In Thailand, it's more like 90. And then there's socio, uh, social orphans, right? Addiction, incarceration. I mean, those other issues that may improve and the child can go home. This word orphan in the church, anyway, we kind of have this perspective that it's, there's no family at all. And if there is, they're absolutely evil. So we've got to change that. Right. Because we're looking at, again, just look, looking at our own communities. Uh, here I am back in the United States, looking at our own communities. We're, mm -hmm. Our streets are not full of children who's, I can't think of any child in my own social network, other than the one that lives in my home, mm -hmm. whose both parents died. Right. I mean, right. that is just such, such, um, a small percentage of tragedy that children, that children experience. So, you know, how you laid that out is so true. And I keep thinking about generational trauma that we are incurring by disrupting that attachment at such a young yeah. age. Mm -hmm. And then how that will carry into children's lives as they become adults and don't have healthy attachment patterns to be able to have strong marriages and to have strong relationships with their own children. I mean, we are, we're just proliferating attachment breaks and um and disrupted families for generations because of this work well in in that research with the um children who grew up in care i forget what the percentage was but it it, it was several adult children said would put their own children in residential care because they have no clue what it means to be a parent of course and uh, and don't we all like as we start out as parents we mimic and we parrot and we copy what our parents did to us because that's the model that we have and so gosh that is such I want to just put a put a pin in the research that you've the Lumos research that you have that you've mentioned and mm -hmm. also want to just ask if people are listening to this and they have a position in a church or they they have an audience with their church leadership and they're saying look I know that we support an orphanage how can we be doing this better are people able mm -hmm. to access that Lumos research? Let me ask that first. Is that something that's open source? Sure. Yes. They can just go on the Lumo website. L U and access that. Okay. Uh -huh. It's so, actually JK Rowling Foundation. Uh, uh, wow. I mean, she she started it because I um, you know she was a very struggling single mom. Mm -hmm. And she knew what it was like to worry about putting food on the table before she became famous as an author. And then when she heard about the Romanian and Eastern European orphanage crises, as she was able to get some money, she's like, wow, that's where I want to invest my money. And and she actually is the only person that's had a billion dollars that went under the billion dollars because she gives so much away to the cause of orphans around the world. So uh, to family strengthening, basically, I mean, to helping nations and um, governments um, transition their model of care. But I will say there is anything the church can do. I mean, they can for sure really find out more about the orphanage that they support. Um, is it registered? I mean, that's a big one, right? Like so many are not even registered in the countries that they live in. Um, do they have a reintegration program? Are there, is there permanency plans for those children? You know, are they making plans to strengthen the family so that the children can go back? I mean, sometimes children do have to temporarily leave um, for reasons, but often they don't. And so family strengthening programs cost money, but um, they're much more effective at keeping children in families and strengthening families and communities to care for their own orphans and vulnerable children. That's what we want the church to do, right? To care for the vulnerable children in their community. And you you can't do that by just rest, pulling them out of the river, right? And just throwing them in an orphanage unless you deal with upstream, which is the poverty. Absolutely. Um, I really love the work of safe families in the United States and the work that they mm -hmm. do with families here. So yeah. we'll, we can link to that as well. But if anyone is, you know, wanting to tap into your biblical framework um, and the yeah. training you're doing for 
for the Thai church and for pastors in Thailand? That's something I'm asking because I don't know. Is that something sure. that you guys- I mean, you can go up on our website and we okay. have a whole link of like, you click on, do you want trauma-informed care training? Do you want family strengthening training? Do you want, we just published, um, I don't know if published is the right book, but we just produced a beautiful new family strengthening handbook looking at um, crises intervention. And um, it's now gone to like, I don't know how many countries in the world. It's amazing. So many people want access to this. Um, so that's on our website. If anybody even wants to download that book, you can download it for free at the top of our website. It says download the handbook here. It's great. And I, I think it has a lot of universal. Yes, it was created in Thailand, but it has a lot of universal practices that can be used in any country around the world. Some people like in Honduras, a girl there is actually taking the book and translating it into Spanish for Central America. And she's just removing there's chapter six is government services. So she'll put in Honduras services. And then there's stories of strength woven throughout the book. And she will put in Honduras stories of strength of families. So, so it can definitely be translated. It's a great tool. Um, shout out to our staff who wrote it Kristen she's amazing she just had a baby and um so she's on maternity leave but she did a phenomenal job researching 10 organizations that deliver family strengthening services and looking at their promising practices and then how can we use this where we work around the world so it's a great tool um, we have a keeping families together program that started with that single mom on that uh, daycare doorstep that day and um that's a great tool. And every now and then we do an English training. So reach out to us if you're interested in getting that three-day English training, how to use those tools. So we have a lot on our website to learn. It's so great. <clears throat> uh, what a great way to, to end this, you know, again, not feeling like there's nothing that you can do, but that we have a responsibility mm -hmm. to tap into the re resources that mm -hmm. are there, the research that is there. We, we can marry, mm -hmm. we can marry scripture with psychology with sociology, mm -hmm. with the study of humans. I mean, science is not just, you know, limited to cells and cancer research. We have amazing right. science that relates to our brains, that relates to familial structures that God knows already. And why would we not include that in what we're doing? Right. Um, thank you for all that you offer. Um, we will make sure that everyone has access to your website. Um, I have personally lived in your home and watched you work for hours on end tirelessly in your room, pounding out papers, pounding out research, and just giving your all, every bit of your energy to this field and this work. And really, I cannot thank you enough for who you are and for the way you share your life with others. Mm, well, you are welcome. You're a joy in your family. I'll do a little commercial though. Um, in February of this year, there's a global conference called World Without Orphans in Chiang Mai, Thailand. You just go on the World Without Orphans website. You'll learn about that. And then every year is CAFO, Christian Alliance for Orphans. Um, in September, they have a summit. If you go on the CAFO website, you can learn about how you can also join those two really big global movements. And KFO is going to be in Nashville this fall. So I will be there yes. and I hope that you will be speaking again, I hope, and we'll get yes. to see you there. So I am, I'm very excited. So thank you so much. Um, these are going to be some long show notes with some excellent links. Thank you so much for listening in. And we are always eager to hear from you as you process these nuanced topics. Shoot me an email at lauren at kindredexchange.co or find me on Instagram at upwardly dependent. Of course, I always welcome your honest reviews on whatever platform you are listening to this podcast, or you can engage with us on our Kindred Exchange Instagram at kindred.exchange. Just do me one favor. As we process and grow together, stay rooted in truth that you know is absolute. And that is the fact that we are finite beings and therefore rely on something much bigger than ourselves. That's what the Upwardly Dependent Life is all about.